Matthew chapter 2, as I look at a very familiar scene that we've all heard and seen in, in the plays, I want you to listen carefully to the incredible moments of Jesus' birth and this one particular description of those coming from a great distance away to worship him. It's Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the, the chief priests and the scribes and the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem. And he said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. When they had come, into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. God created you that you might know him. He designed you specifically and he fashioned your life in such a way that you might know him. And that upon knowing him that you might fall in love with him and have a love relationship with the last forever and ever and ever. That's why he created you with a soul that is eternal. That's why he placed within you a desire to find him. And he reveals himself to those who diligently seek him. Those who respond to that innate desire to find God. The question is, do you want to know him? He's already demonstrated that he loves you enough to send his son. He would be born, he would die, he'd be resurrected to new life. That you might know him. But the question is, do you want to know him? God. There's a single mom named Ronnie. When I first got to know her, she was a successful businesswoman, but her family had all fallen apart. She was in a bad place. And as I got to know her, she, she knew absolutely nothing about God. She had never been in church in her life. But you could tell that she desperately wanted to know that if there is a God, can I know him? Well, she had been invited to our church. She had come to a few Bible studies, but everything just seemed so new and she never heard this stuff in her life. And she's trying to figure out in her mind, do I really believe this? Is there really a God and can I know him? Well, she often traveled for work. And one particular Monday morning, she was getting up very, very early to go on a trip. And as she was getting ready, she remembered that the very day before she was in our church that I had preached on prayer and I had challenged people to make time for prayer and to, to call out to God. And, and so again, she, she had never prayed in her entire life, but somehow she was gripped that morning as she got up early in the day to give it a try. And, and I, I want to read for you in her own words what she said about the very first prayer that she ever made in her entire life. She said, so there I am in the shower trying to pray for the very first time. 
Wow, did I feel silly. I, I apologized to God for not knowing what to say. But I asked him to look out for my family and my friends, but I also asked him to prove to me that he actually does exist. She, she says, wow, what a request, I thought. You must be on something pretty strong to think that you're worthy of God showing you that he exists. So I finished my prayer. I got out of the shower, and while I was brushing my teeth, the phone started ringing. That was strange. I went to the phone, and, and I looked at the number. It was a lady from our church named Susan, and I couldn't answer because my mouth was full of toothpaste, so I, I, I let it go to the voicemail, and I continued. Then the phone rang again, and it was Susan again. Well, I figured that it must be important if she is calling me at 5 o'clock in the morning, twice, she realized it must be important. So she said, I spit out the toothpaste, I answered it, and Susan was electric. She apologized for calling me so early, but she knew that I was leaving and she needed to talk to me before I left. And so she says, okay, I'm thinking in my mind, what's going on? And then she told me that God had woken her up to pray for me. She said that God wanted her to call me and tell me that he loves me. My heart fell into my stomach. There wasn't a spot in my body that didn't have goosebumps. She said that, that she hesitated to call because it was so early, but was compelled to call anyway. I'm so glad she did. God answered my prayer. Little old me, my prayer. God does love me. God is looking out for me. And the last word she said was, wow. Wow. Listen to those who really want to know God. He has a way of making himself known. In fact, God is doing it all around the world. No matter what culture, no matter what language, God is making himself known. A Christian in Iraq told a testimony of finding Christ. He said, it was a dream. I was trembling in the dark when I looked and I saw a man in the distance standing in a door filled with light. And it was Jesus, and I knew I had to get to him. But as I started toward him, ferocious lions were on either side of the path. They jumped at me and they clawed at me. They gnashed their teeth trying to destroy me. But Jesus called to me, told me to focus my eyes on him and keep walking. And as I walked toward Jesus, the lions parted and I went straight to him. He said, I awoke from the dream and I knew Jesus was real. And so the next day I found a Christian heard the gospel and gave my life to Jesus, and now I must tell my Muslim brothers that Jesus can save them too. I've heard stories like that all over the place, of unique ways in which God is making himself known in the scriptures and, and bringing them to Christ. I'm here to tell you that believers around the world are celebrating the Christmas story all over the place. Well, we're in a sermon series called Christmas, The Story of Salvation. We, we've already looked at the virgin birth and why it had to be. We've looked at the name of Jesus and his power to save. And this morning I want to look at the Christmas story and how we respond when God makes himself known. That God, through the prophets, foretold of the coming Christ 700 years before the event that God through the angel made himself known to Mary. He made himself known to Joseph. He made himself known to the shepherds in the field. And today we're gonna to look at men who make it into every Christmas program, the wise men from the East. Well, the sermon today is called Salvation Has a Condition. It's Lordship. And we read earlier in this service, Matthew chapter two, verses one through 12, that fascinating story that, that gives great hope to all people no matter where they're from. And as God makes himself known, it seems like people throughout time have had various responses when they came to know who he was. Some respond enthusiastically, Christ has come. And others resist and turn him away. Well, that's true then and it's true today. But well, the first thing I want you to see is that Jesus was met with worship. In verse 1, it says that 
the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem to find the king of the Jews. And, and we're familiar with the story, yet there, there still is a mystery about who these guys were. Now, we, we all know that Christmas carol, We Three Kings, that we've sung it as children and all through our life. Well, here's a, here's a few things we need to get straight. First of all, they were not kings, but they were wise men. Second of all, we're not told how many wise men there were. Could have been three, could have been less, could have been more. All we're told is that there were three gifts that were given. They were not at the manger scene, at the night that Jesus was born. If you look at verse 11, it states that they came to a house, and Jesus in this passage is not referred to as a baby, but as a young child. And finally, we don't know where they're from. Just that they were from another country somewhere in the east. Now, now we've said that they were not kings, but we're quite certain that they had a great influence over the kings. That they studied the stars and other ancient means of wisdom. They were scholarly. They were learned men that were highly respected who gave guidance and counsel to those in authority. And isn't it interesting that the men who studied the stars were given a sign of what? A star. It's fascinating that the things that, that we're focused on and capture our minds, God uses to get our attention. That God spoke to them through something that they loved and that they studied. And I love the fact that God knew what would get their attention. Now hear this carefully. God loves us enough to meet us where we are and to speak to us in our own language. He knows how to communicate. Like any good speaker, he knows his audience. He knows how to connect. He knows how to get our attention. He knew how to get the attention of the wise men from the east as they were studying the stars. He gave them a star that would lead them to the Christ child. And, and what is true then is true today. I believe that God will communicate with this generation in a, in a way that they can understand. And, and guess what? We've got to do the same thing. We must communicate with people today in a way that gets their attention, in a way that touches them right where they are, in a way that will communicate the gospel story in a way that they understand. And while we still have many questions about these men, there's some things we do know. They traveled a long way to come find Jesus. We, we, we know that when they saw the child, when they saw Jesus, God confirmed in their heart that this was indeed the king of the Jews. And, and we, we know that they gave him expensive gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. They were Gentiles worshiping the king of the Jews. Because Jesus was not born for just the king of the Jews. He was the king of kings. And in fact, this messianic hope of the Jews was well known among other countries. The, the global impact of the Messiah was known in Gentile lands. And so here we find Gentiles coming to see the Messiah and they worship him. See, that first Christmas, wise men came from the east to pay homage to Jesus. But second, Jesus was also met with hostility. So, some came and worshiped him, but others weren't quite so happy with his coming and they, they were hostile toward Christ. In verse two, the wise men came to Jerusalem and they're looking for the king of the Jews that they might worship him. And there they found King Herod and he was not so happy to hear about another king's birth. And so he, he tried to play along so he might find out where Jesus was, but he was not thinking about worship. He was thinking about murder. In verse 3, it says, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. That little statement is kind of significant. You see, the people had learned that when Herod was troubled, everybody needs to be afraid. Somebody's going to die. He, he had a reputation of trying to put down anyone who might surpass him and become king. He, he was well known for taking out any rivals to his authority. And so he plotted to find out where Jesus was so he might take out Jesus as well. 
And all Jerusalem was troubled with him because they knew something bad's about to happen when Herod is upset of any rival to his authority. Well, verse 12 tells us that the Magi were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. And so when they didn't come back, Herod knew that they'd found him and that uh, they left another way. And so he's upset. And he had all the boys under the age of two killed in the vicinity around Bethlehem. He refused to yield his power to anyone, even the Son of God. He didn't want anyone telling him what to do. He was in charge, and any rival to his authority was going to be put down. But listen, Herod is not the only one who's hostile to Jesus. Herod's not the only one who refused to set aside their authority and submit to Jesus as Lord. He's not the only one to resist Jesus even today. But understand something. To reject Jesus as Lord does not negate the fact that he is Lord. You may not recognize him as Lord, but that doesn't mean he's not Lord. That does not mean that you're not under his authority. See, how you treat Jesus does not detract from who he is. And someday, whether you acknowledge it today or not, someday every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is indeed Lord of all. You see, it's interesting how people say, well, I just don't believe that. I don't want to yield to that. He's not my Lord. Well, that doesn't mean he's not Lord of all. And someday you'll give an account to your life to him. See, from the time of Herod to this very day, people have refused to acknowledge the kingdom of God. People have rejected Jesus as king. People who become hostile, even against those who proclaim the gospel of good news. And when they reject Jesus, they reject salvation. They reject their only hope of eternal life. Well, third, Jesus requires a response. That Jesus requires a response. As I look at Herod and the wise men, I'm amazed how vastly different they respond. But I guess it will always be that way. Some, like Herod, are hostile to him, refusing to yield to Jesus as Lord of their life. Some, like the Magi, are going to worship him, humbly bowing down to worship him as Lord. But the reality is that there are more people like Herod than the Magi. They resist Jesus' right to be Lord. They don't want anybody guiding them or leading them or telling them how they should live or things they should do or not do. They don't want, they don't want to yield their rights to his right over their life. See, there's many reasons why people refuse Jesus, but I think the chief reason among them is that they're afraid that Jesus is going to take control of their life. They want to do their own thing. They, they want to seek their own dreams. They want to enjoy life how they want to enjoy life. And they're afraid if they give their life to Jesus, he just might take control of their life. Well, guess what? That's exactly what he wants to do. D don't believe any kind of gospel that leaves you in charge. Don't believe any, any kind of Christianity that, that, that he serves you, doing what you want and, and causing you to be blessed all the days of your life as if somehow we're the master and he's the servant to, trying to give us good things in life. That, that's completely opposite to what the Bible says. If he's Lord, then he's Lord. And if he's Lord of your life, then you serve him. I, I, I'm telling you, if people who are afraid he might take control, that's exactly what he wants to do. But the problem is they don't understand when he's in control, that's when abundant life starts. That's when the good life begins. He made you. He created you. He understands what makes for an abundant life. L listen, our society is consumed with power. They want to be in control. They want to be in charge. 
They're okay with a Savior, but they refuse to bow to him as Lord. They say, nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm going to determine my own destiny. And indeed, they will. They're free to take any road they choose, but all those roads will lead to the same place, away from God. And because they want to be the master of their own destiny, they will receive the, the, the best that they can do, temporary riches and eternal death. There's only one way that leads to heaven. The Bible's explicitly clear that Jesus is the only way to heaven. And the reason he came from heaven down to earth was to, to show us the way, to actually be the way. That he came to do what we could not do. He came to take away our sin so that we could have a relationship with the holy God. And there's nobody else that can take away our sin. And, and, and if we, we say this often around here, if sin is your problem, there's no human remedy. Only Christ can take away your sin. And by resisting Jesus, they seal their fate. But there are others. There are millions around this earth who have chosen to yield their life to Jesus as Lord. And they have discovered that the rule of Christ in their life is not oppressive, it is not a burden, it literally sets them free. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Jesus would say things like this, cast your burdens upon me. He didn't come to create a burden, he came to relieve your burden. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. He said, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. That's how much he loves us. He says, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. He says, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. He says, whoever drinks the water that I shall give him will never thirst. You get this sense that Jesus is using every expression possible to communicate in a way we understand his love and care for his people. That giving your life to Jesus results in a good life. That he's the shepherd who'll protect you. He's the light that brings you out of darkness. He's the bread that satisfies your hunger. He's the living water that quenches your thirst. The rule of Jesus is not burdensome. It's the only relationship that truly satisfies. Listen, perfect love is not oppressive. It is refreshing to the soul. And the king loves you. We remembered his sacrifice this morning. For those who are thinking, I don't know if I want to give my life to Jesus. It's gonna, I don't know if I'm going to like that. Listen, he loved you enough to die for you. He came all the way that you might know him. He promised, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. That, that I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die, but live forever. Why would you hesitate to yield to him? Because the only other option, as the old, the old rock and roll song said, you got to serve somebody. Either Jesus or Satan, who are you going to serve? He says, come to me. And even when we don't always understand his ways, his ways are always best. You see, in the story, when I, when I see the wise men from the east, I'm reminded that the gospel is not reserved for some particular people, but it's for all people, Jews and Gentiles alike, that no matter who you are, no matter where you've come from, no matter how great your sin is, the king has come for you. Well, it's interesting to look how people in the past have responded to the birth of Christ. But the important question today is this, who's the king of your life? Who have you yielded your life to? What's your response to Jesus? This morning, are you like the Magi, the wise men from the East? 
Do you worship Jesus as Lord of your life? Are you like Herod? Are you resisting? Are you not ready to yield your life to him as Lord? You want to go to heaven when you die. You want a savior. You're not sure about this lordship. You don't get one without the other. Are you ready to yield your life to him? See, God's made himself known. Now you must respond. Salvation has a condition. It's lordship. Abundant life is on the other side of obedience. For if he is your Lord, he will save you from your sin. Can you bow your heads for a moment? Heavenly Father, your word reveals your glory. Your word has shown us who you are. The testimony down through the ages is the same. You're worthy of our worship. Father, as we worship you today, may it not be just in words only, may our life yield to you. Father, if there's anyone in this room today, anyone who's watching online today, who has not yet yielded to you, that no matter what they say, you're not the Lord. No matter what they say, you're not their Savior. And Father, we tend to look at ourselves and we don't feel like we're that bad. We look at ourselves and we we think the sin in our life is not, not that bad. But we're reminded today, as we remember the Lord's Supper, that our sin was bad enough that Jesus had to leave heaven to come to earth and die upon a cruel cross because of our sin. Unless we come to him, we remain in our sin. Unless we come to him, we remain separated from a holy God. But if we repent, if we choose Christ as Lord, everything changes. Father, we yield to you today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.